Great. Well, hello everyone. I am so excited to have you this evening to start our Global Ed TV series for 2017, brought to you by the Global Education Conference Network and Know My World. My name is Lisa Petro. I'll talk a little bit uh, in a moment about who I am, but I just wanted to share a few things. Uh, last year, we were able to run this series in the spring of 2016, and we were really looking, taking a hard look at global education, opening it up and um, kind of digging into some key terms like global competence, cultural competence, intercultural communication, really understanding how these elements fit into our curriculum, um, how they have become a necessary part of, of learning and education, and how as educators we have a responsibility to illuminate that uh, for our students um, and for our learning communities. And so whereas last year we sort of dug in and we broke that into different areas from definitions all the way to practitioners, um, and we invited different people from all over the world to contribute to that conversation, this year we wanted to take a little bit of a different approach. Uh, we wanted to look at the very um, real projects uh, that can happen in the classroom that promote this kind of learning. And so um, Know My World, an organization that I co-founded, uh, we have a series of projects that we do inside of a classroom in the American School Taichung in Taichung, Taiwan. So in this series, we're really going to look at uh, the kinds of processes um, that can bring this learning to students of all ages and all kinds of learning communities. So just a little bit about um, who we are, well, the Global Education Conference Network, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Uh, Global Education Conference Network is a collaborative, inclusive, worldwide community initiative. It involves students, educators, organizations from all levels. As a matter of fact, I think they hit the 20,000 participant mark this year. Um, they have activities that are designed to increase opportunities for connecting classrooms. They support cultural awareness, recognition of diversity, educational access for all, um, and they host a series of events um, throughout the year. And so I really encourage you to please go to their website, check them out, join, register for the community, and participate in this great network of educators uh, in the world. And then for us, well, we're, my, our organization is called Know My World. Um, we're a, a small international organization co-founded in 2012. Um, we're a global education resource. Essentially what we do is coach teachers in digital shared learning experiences with classrooms all over the globe. So twice a year we offer a free scholarship program, um, unfortunately to a limited amount of teachers. Um, but we uh, create an opportunity to connect teachers and coach them through the kinds of processes um, that are required to manage um, digital online collaborative learning relationships. Um, we also focus on the social, emotional, cultural, and academic cornerstones of learning, and we do that through a variety of programs. You're, you're going to see a series of projects in, in, in the, um, this uh, segment and also through professional development opportunities, so um, doing capacity building and teacher training uh, in regards to global education. Okay. So one big thanks to our sponsors, uh, people who are able to make this uh, learning experience possible. So of course, I've mentioned Global Education Conference Network, uh, Ourselves Know My World, VIF, which is now Participate. Uh, amazing organization with a long-standing history of having high-quality projects for participation and the learning revolution, a great source of information and innovation in technology and uh, global education. And so all of you can, uh, I hope, see this uh, map here. And what I'd like to ask you to do on the left-hand side of your uh, user bar here, there is um, like a menu. And the second one down from the arrow cursor is something that looks like a sun. If you can just select that, I believe you'll have to double click on that, and then click on the area of the world that you're joining us from so we can see our truly amazing international audience. So I'm going to go ahead and click where I am. I am in North Mexico right now working in Ciudad Juarez. 
And if you could all go ahead and do that as well. Uh, tools to be enabled. My apologies. Is that working? Huh. I apologize here. I was under the impression that they were enabled. Let me try this again. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm. I enabled the whiteboard. Ah, there we go. I see some people. Thanks so much for your patience. Wow, great. We have people from Argentina, Taiwan. It looks like the West Coast in the U.S., the East Coast, California. Is that Arizona? Awesome. Great. Uh, Canada? Are we are we in Canada? Awesome. This is wonderful. Oh, and I'm sorry, my explorer. Japan? Excellent. Well, it's just amazing to see such an intercultural audience here. <laughs> Great. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. I hope everybody has had an opportunity to um, select their location on the board. I'm going to go ahead and move forward then. All right, so just a little bit about myself. As I mentioned, my name is Lisa Petro, and I am the co-founder of Know My World. I am also a curriculum development consultant, um, and I specialize in social and emotional learning, cultural competence, and global education. Um, I love my work, some of my notable work. Um, currently, I'm working for Tech de Monterrey in Mexico. I work for the uh, Prepa Tech system, the preparatory high school. And I've supported them in designing a multicultural program curriculum uh, for their students and um, also to develop uh, for professional development for their teachers. Um, I also enjoy doing volunteer work with an NGO called The Grail. It's an international women's uh, organization. And every year in March, I support them um, in the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women designing uh, workshops um, to support all the girls from ages 14 to 30 that they bring from around the world to speak on the panels there. And I also have a, a quite a long history, an enjoyable history in professional development for teachers um, in many countries all over the world. So that is who I am. And uh, so just a little background about the series. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, what we wanted to do is to get a little bit more detailed about how we can bring some of these key terms inside of global education into the classroom. Our primary goal is to provide scaffolded projects for you which focus on the kinds of social and emotional foundations that are necessary for the development of, of global citizens. So we're really trying to get to the basis of uh, the, the internal of, of a student in developing cultural competency. Um, I've included a link here for you. And, and just so you know, all links, information, uh, including a work cited from the development of the series, will be made available to you. I'm going to be posting a link in the chat box in just a few moments, and you can find those resources. This link is pointed towards an internal report that we did in Know My World for the 2014-15 school year. And it was done with the very classroom uh, that we are going to be working with this year in the series. Um, and it was an exploratory study to see the validity of our projects and programs um, in relationship to what we're, we're purporting here. So in this study, you'll see that we've explored two primary questions. Number one, how effective are Know My World projects in guiding students along social and emotional pathways while supporting academic achievement? And also, how does Know My World projects affect student lives and their school communities? Um, so we really encourage you to have a look at this report. Uh, there's rich content and information between student artifacts and also parent interviews. So you can see the kinds of questions we asked if you'd like to uh, use something like this in your own classroom. Just a breakdown of the series. Um, so there will be five parts to this series. We're going to do a project every month. So there will be one segment a month. It will be approximately an, an hour long. It is a developmental series. So we are doing this with the intention that what we do today will lead into the projects, the remaining projects. 
However, that doesn't mean that you couldn't use these in piecemeal to enrich your classes um, and to enrich the student's uh, experience. Um, from each one of these sessions, we will leave you with a pretty comprehensive resource list. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be a work cited from the development of the project, any kind of links or um, external resources that support you in that. And also, we've developed a template for the lesson plan and a rubric, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, so that will all be included for you in the resource package after every segment. So as you can see, today we're going to begin with uh, looking at cultural identity as the foundation for cultural competence, and then we're going to move into critical thinking uh, about social situations. We're going to address labeling um, and the impact of making assumptions on others. Of course, that will lead into conscious communication, how we choose words when we're dealing with intercultural relationships. And then lastly, we're going to look at a small piece of developing uh, in-service learning through needs and wants and having this sort of awareness of those distinctions and how it can impact a uh, community. So I think it's fair to just begin to give you um, a little bit of, of context for why we're developing this series before we dig into the first project. So I think the biggest question here is so we can get clear about our, our, our mission, our goal. Well, what is a global citizen? And so this is actually from a UNESCO report in 2014 called Preparing Learners for Global Citizenship Education. And inside of this, and, and this is one of many definitions, again, I, I want to just uh, really emphasize that these definitions inside of global citizenship, intercultural competence, cultural competence, they're highly subjective um, for obvious reasons, cultural implications, um, and different backgrounds and experiences all are going to determine the way that you think um, this kind of competency exists within your communities. But um, UNESCO, I think, is a pretty good general definition. So they've defined global citizenship as a sense of belonging to a broader community and common humanity. It emphasizes the political, the economic, the social, and the cultural interdependency and interconnectedness between local, national, and global. And I think this is really important because a lot of times with global citizenship as educators, we tend to put that focus on the international. It's somewhere else. It's out there. And um, global, global citizenship and, and cultural competency has just as much weight and importance inside of our own local communities, our ability to be multicultural and interact with people right in front of us in our classrooms, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. So I think this is a, a great broad definition. And UNESCO is um, saying that there are three domains of learning when we look at developing global citizenship education. So the first piece is this cognitive, right? So this is what we know. This is our knowledge. This is information. Um, and from what we know, that process of development, we move into this socio-emotional piece of how we feel. So we have these two sides, the what we know and the how we feel. How we feel meaning our own self-awareness of who we are, um, where we come from, um, and the way in which that dictates a response in the world, how that impacts others in our relationships. And then the third piece of that, of course, is that external, right? So it's the behavior. It's, it's what we know, how we feel, and then how does that behave? How does that manifest itself in the world? And is that something that's effective and appropriate? And so from this basis, when we develop our projects for Know My World, we look at attaining these three areas. But for us, one of the most important pieces is the socio-emotional. Because how we feel, even sometimes we know, but how we feel can really elicit uh, the response mechanism or the reaction. So the result of having uh, global citizens, having culturally competent uh, students, is this impact. We have students who are culturally aware. They're, they're not stuck in what um, uh, Bennett and Hammer might call some denial in their continuum. They're aware of themselves. They're aware of other cultures. They're aware of how they contribute and interface with the world. And they're also culturally 
sensitive so they know what's appropriate. They understand cultural appropriateness. They understand um, the way in which they can respond to the world in an effective way. And that result is, is students who are culturally adaptable. So they're able to go in and out of different contexts responsibly um, and really work to co-construct solutions in the world. So a little bit of a discussion about the development of our projects and our evaluation method that we're going to be sharing with you. Um, so inside of this, we saw, I love this quote from uh, Robert Keegan in Harvard Graduate School of Education. Successfully functioning in a society with diverse values, traditions, and lifestyles requires us to have a relationship to our own reactions rather than be captive of them. So I realize that this could be a very Western interpretation, um, but at the same time, it gives, us, it gives us and our students some responsibility about being able to transform who we are, how we interface with the world, what we want to create in, in, in the definition of being effective with others while taking into consideration others' feelings and others' contributions. And so that really has led us in the development of these projects. We looked at three areas of, of development as the basis for why we want to focus so heavily on the socio-emotional. So the first is Dr. Darla Deardorff's model of intercultural competence. Now she um, is part of a very long history, 50 years of research in the field, um, but she was able in the mid-2000s to bring together um, a sampling of scholars and administrators and really find through a Delphi study what is intercultural competence? What does that look like? And so inside of that, she developed a tiered system. And at the basis of that, of that model is attitudes. So in the development of intercultural competence and all of the key areas of that process, the foundational piece here has an attitudes segment, respect, openness, curiosity, that builds into our knowledge, our comprehension of others, the kinds of skills, how we apply what we know. And the results of that are internal and external outcomes. So this is a process model that she has created. And you can see inside of this the real emphasis on our ability to be socially and emotionally intelligent alongside of intercultural competence. The second piece of our development is in specifically in the socio-emotional, and we looked at the work, the research of CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And in their core competencies model, they have five areas of learning, five competencies that are essential for social and emotional intelligence. And so as you can imagine, it, you can look at this and already see the fit between intercultural competence. This ability to be self-aware and recognize one's emotions, an ability to self-manage and regulate your emotions, your thoughts, your behaviors. There's the social awareness, taking the perspective of and empathizing with others from diverse backgrounds, relationship skills, so establishing and maintaining healthy and rewarding relationships amongst that diversity. And then lastly, responsible decision making. So our ability here to make constructive and respectful choices about our personal behavior and the influence it has in our social interactions. And so having this basis for intercultural competence and also this basis inside of social and emotional intelligence, we looked at what is that behavioral piece? What is that manifestation? And here we have King and Baxter Megolda's model of intercultural maturity. And this is really a manifestation of that. So it covers those three areas, the cognitive, the interpersonal, and the interpersonal, and it does it on a developmental level. So there's this initial piece, students beginning in this sort of initial awareness and um, then moving into the intermediate and then a long continuum of maturity. And I think this is a really um, helpful uh, thing to remember for educators is that our responsibility, yes, is to create learning experiences for students and bring them to new enlightenment and understanding, but our responsibility is also to meet them where they're at. And so sometimes it can be really hard to work with that student who stereotypes, who bullies, who doesn't have this kind of understanding. Um, another notable research, um, and I've included it in the research resource list, 
um, and, I have, and it's worth mentioning, is uh, Mitchell Hammer and Milton Bennett's developmental continuum of uh, intercultural sensitivity in which people move from denial all the way to adaptation. So having said that, there is this developmental piece and we want to support students in exhibiting those kinds of behaviors. So we took these three elements and we looked to design a rubric. What are we seeking? What are we looking for in students? And these are the four key indicators that we wanted to discover. So the first piece is self-awareness. Do we, do we have students that through our projects are developing a knowledge of self-identity and the personal reactions that they have through some kind of critical thought? Also openness, are they willing to accept diverse people and ideas in a way that invites multiple perspectives? Are they sensitive to the needs and the responses of others? Can they manage their own responses, their own responses and beliefs in order to have um, an effective impact uh, with, within their relationships? And lastly, is there a sense of adaptability? Can they shift their behaviors and participate in some sort of dualistic thinking to co-construct power sharing um, to level the power differential in those relationships? And this is the rubric that we have developed. So um, again, this will be available for you to read. It will be in your resource list. But just know that our project evaluation is going to work um, in this manner. In the same idea of development in maturity, we're going to go from this limited uh, kind of uh, skill set to a moderate and then a more advanced. And we're going to cover these four areas of competency. And the flow design of our projects is in relation to Kolb's model of experiential learning. So the idea is that we're providing new experiences and we're pulling in students' personal experiences to give them context for these concepts. Uh, so students, you know, people, we have concrete experiences. We, we can't necessarily change that, right? Um, from those experiences, we observe, we reflect on what we have experienced, and that turns into an abstract conceptualization. Uh, we come to conclusions about what that experience meant, how we interpreted it. And then from that, we've gained new information to create active experimentation, to take on other experiences, new experiences from that perspective. And it's a cycle of learning. Um, and so all of our projects are based inside of the experiential. And the kind of evidence is that you'll see, well, when assessing cultural competence um, or social and emotional learning, you need to cover all of the bases, so the qualitative, the quantitative, the formative process piece, and then also the summative, the results of uh, what you've created. So these are examples from the projects that you'll see um, for each of these areas that we'll be collecting as evidence. Okay, so I would like to take this opportunity now to introduce you to our global educator, the person responsible for um, implementing um, and also co-designing these projects. Um, her name is Genevieve Murphy. She is the co-founder of Know My World, my partner. Um, and she is also the social and emotional learning coordinator for American School Tai Chung. She specializes in social and emotional learning coordination, English language arts, and also program coordination for a variety of um, schools, including private and international systems. So Genevieve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. I really appreciate you joining us for this session. And I'm excited to share this project with you and hope that through this, um, through this project, it inspires you to think of ways that you can incorporate uh, cultural awareness projects into your classroom. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I work in the American School of Taichung, and I do a lot of work that focuses on social and emotional learning. I feel that that's an intricate part of education, and it's important to give students a solid foundation in who they are so then they're able to go forward in life and be productive citizens and have that necessary skill set to be culturally competent and sensitive and aware. Um, so as we begin, I would like to uh, introduce to you my school. 
that I am currently working at. I teach third grade in at AST, which is the American School of Taichung, which is located in the foothills of the mountains here in Taichung. It's a beautiful campus tucked away, um, so it's a nice break from the busyness of the city. It is an, an international school, and so we do operate with a Western curriculum, and we incorporate Washington State standards as well as Common Core and Next Gen Science standards. Of course, we want our students to be prepared in 21st century skills, so we do a lot of technology and project-based learning, and we emphasize ESLIS, which are expected school-wide learning results. And this is actually actually where a lot of the work that I do focuses on. So teaching students how to be lifelong learners, critical thinkers, effective communicators, cooperative individuals, productive persons, so the citizens, and responsible individuals. We are affiliated with the Ear Coast uh, which is the East Asia Regional Council of Schools. So we do a lot of, I will actually be presenting at the conference there next month. Um, uh, work, doing a workshop that focuses on fostering civil citizenship through digital collaboration. So for all the international schools in Asia, it's a good part of the conference. So. Genevieve, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could I just request that you speak up a little louder? Some people are having a hard time hearing. Okay. I'm so sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Is this better? Yep. Okay. Thank you. And we are also affiliated with, uh, sorry, we are WASC accredited. So a lot of our high school students who graduate want to uh, go on to attend Western University in the United States, Canada, Australia, and UK. So I would now like to introduce my students. These are my students from five different countries. And so it's nice that it's a small class. I have three girls and eight boys. And they're from Japan, Taiwan, Iceland, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And as a global educator, um, something that I really try and focus on with my students is, of course, preparing them for the necessary academic and technological skills that they need to be successful. But also a lot of what Lisa mentioned in the beginning part of this um, session is that teaching them to have the foundational skills in social and emotional competence and teaching them to be conscious citizens and through that having a strong sense of self and to be free thinkers and eventually over time having the skills to be effective global leaders. Culture is something that is discussed pretty regularly in my classroom. And I feel that the more interaction that students have with this concept and this topic, um, the more awareness that they are able to gain of their own culture as well as um, sensitivity towards other cultures and an acceptance of cultural differences. And through this interactive cultural programs that incorporate, they learn to enjoy culture and look forward to learning new things and understanding that each culture is unique and special um, and something that they need to be proud of of their, of their own identity. So with this project specifically, this uh, project is creating a class culture book. And there's many steps to it. But the objectives of this project is to have the students be culturally aware and sensitive to others, to connect with themselves and their family on a deeper level, and to be proud of who they are and where they come from. OK, 
Okay, um, I'll just jump in and share a little bit about the project overview just really quickly. This particular project is called Cultures in the Classroom, Cultivating Cultural Identity, that's a mouthful, <laughs> with students. Um, we want it to reach four competency areas here. So in this project, students will develop a sense of self-awareness, also social awareness of others, uh, cultural identity, and cultural awareness. Genevieve, do you want to share about the common core standards that you selected? I know that for this series, we have intentionally chosen to work with a third grade classroom, but we will give you some tips at the end of ways that you can modify this for different uh, grade levels. Yes, that's correct. And yes, so this project focuses a lot on language arts, and there is a speaking element in which the students interview their parents and a presentation element in which they share what they've learned with the class and writing elements, of course, making the class culture book as well as writing a journal reflection. And there's also a lot of, not a lot of class discussions so students, again, have opportunities to speak and to share and also practice in note taking. Um, so it's very heavily um, it uses a lot of language arts uh, elements. Okay, and so expected learning outcomes inside of this particular project. We're looking for um, students to know where cultural exists in a variety of areas in their lives. Um, we don't want them to just be stuck inside of things like nationalism um, or religion, but understanding the family construct and the classroom community through this kind of investigative dialogue. We also want them to be able to understand some very specific manifestations of culture. So um, as we've mentioned earlier, we're using Hofstede's model of symbols, heroes, rituals, and values as a set of practices that they would uh, participate in their daily lives. So through critical inquiry and communication, they'll be able to uncover uh, very specific heirlooms that are representative of that. They'll also demonstrate how culture appears in their lives as a connection to their own identity. So starting to really build that self-awareness of who they are, the foundations and the sources of where they come from. And they're going to do that through creating a book that documents these areas of the Hofstede model. Um, and that book would be a, co a collective um, piece for the classroom community. And then lastly, they'll demonstrate cross-cultural understanding inside of this social awareness piece by reviewing that book and doing these kinds of presentations and dialogues using reflective thinking, openness, and sensitivity to their own and others' cultural uh, backgrounds. So just a really brief overview of Hofstede's model. Um, again, we've included this in the resources. The idea here is that it divides the organization of culture into four areas that influence our behaviors in the world. And this gives students some access to locating those manifestations of cultural identity in a very specific way. Um, it introduces the basis of culture as a shared system, something that's collective. And so looking at things like values, um, what they consider is right, wrong, good, bad, et cetera, rituals, the kinds of practices, whether it's something that's religious or spiritual, or it's greetings, it's discourse, um, it's celebrations, traditions, heroes. So the people that stand out as our cultural representations, that can be people with celebrity, but it can also be personal heroes, grandfathers, um, uh, ancestors, etc. And then lastly, symbols. So the kinds of pictures, gestures, artifacts, uh, colors that have um, uh, weight in, inside of our, our cultural identities. Great, thank you. So as we begin this project, I guess before beginning the project, it's important to create a climate of acceptance and openness um, in your classroom. And so, so I do this by incorporating a lot of contemplative ed practices. So we begin each day with yoga. We do about 15 minutes of yoga. And 
then in five minutes of quiet time where the students take turns reading the, the singing bowl and the rest of the students lie on their mat and I uh, play gentle music and we practice some breathing techniques, very simple ones where I have them notice their, their breath and as their belly rises and falls back towards the mat and also just awareness of their body. So this is a really good time to teach them to be aware of what it is that they are doing. Are they talking? Are they wiggling? Are they moving? Are they distracting their neighbor? And to tell them that they have the ability to make themselves stop <laughs> and to be still and to not talk or not wiggle. And so it's a really, it's only a few minutes of the day, but it's very important because I think that it gives them, it's reiterated, this practice of being aware of what your body is doing and, and how you are behaving in this moment. And they're able to self-correct themselves or stop themselves with this time. And it's nice to see that progression. And in the classroom, of course, you can use this throughout the day um, as the students are transitioning or if they're getting wiggly or wild you know, give them a few minutes to shake their wiggles out but then have them take a few deep breaths and then they're able to reach them through and focus. So we do a lot of yoga, we do a lot of mindfulness awareness and we talk about responsibility a lot. <laughs> so this banner at the bottom is actually hanging in my classroom and it's quite large, it goes across the wall and so each day we talk about being responsible. So if a student comes and tries to paddle on another student, then we talk about being responsible for yourself. Or if a student comes and says, I was talking about my homework, or I didn't do this, or I didn't do that, and we can talk about pushing responsibility and the importance of being prepared and things like that. So it's a lot of repeated dialogue, especially in the lower elementary grades, but it's when you're planting the seeds and you're really getting them to kind of transition into that self-awareness and self-personal responsibility and their ability to do that. And so the more practice we have with that, I feel the stronger those skills are able to become as they progress um, through that. And it's also important to create a cooperative classroom. And so this is done by doing a lot of interactive activities, partner work, uh, group discussions, classroom projects, and just giving them a chance to interact with each other as much as possible and have create open dialogue and, and opportunities for students to share their thoughts because they're very insightful and of course they have a lot to say. So giving them an opportunity to share what it is that they're thinking, A, it gives them confidence in speaking and, and also confidence in their thinking. So they know that what they're thinking is important because they have an opportunity to share it. And so I try and incorporate each day different activities where the students are encouraged to interact with each other. And this also builds mutual respect and collaboration amongst the students as well. And it's also important to teach about culture. So as I mentioned, we, culture is a topic that is discussed pretty much in, in the, from the first day of school, of course, in there about me. Because it's an international school, we talk a lot about the different countries that they're from and they share a little bit about it. But then throughout the first semester, we did a culture unit of each of the cultures that were represented um, in the students, in the students. And in that, we learned about geography, they made a flag, they were given packets of information that included history and activities, we did cooking uh, classes, making a dish from that culture, we did art projects, um, watched videos and learned some of the language. So just really tried to get them interacting with each other's cultures because that breaks down all of those stereotypes and it really and makes learning about cultures fun because they get to do all of these fun and interactive things. So they learn to enjoy culture and appreciate it and appreciate the diversity of it. Um, as the year progresses. So that's kind of the background knowledge or the, the background work um, that I 
did with my students in preparation for this project. Um, now this project is more of a build a fund from all of that backward. Um, but you can <clears throat> incorporate any of those ideas into your classroom and, and find which dynamic works best for you. So the process of this particular project that we're discussing today is, again, beginning with a cost discussion. And I just keep it very broad and very general and just ask what is picture. And the students share what they think. And then we use dictionaries and they look up the word culture and we write the, the definition from the dictionary. And then this just is a way to generate the, the discussion. After that, I ask the students to talk with their family members, their parents or grandparents, and identify an artifact that they feel is culturally representative of, of their family. And I really like this part of the project because, A, the students are practicing interview skills, but B, they're interviewing their parents or their grandparents, and they're talking about something that's important, something that they might not otherwise talk about, and they're really given a chance for both the parents and the child to think about, like, Oh wow, what is our culture? And what is something that represents our culture? And why does this represent our culture? And so it's, it creates an opportunity for rich interaction between the parents and the child. While, of course, also incorporating language arts skills for the women. Then the students are responsible for coming and presenting that object, or that artifact that they identified with their parents and that they did the interview with. And they have a lot of creative um, freedom in this presentation. And so it's nice to see how they choose to present. So some students brought in food uh, to share with everyone, and of course they got one thing. But um, that was really nice of them to do. And other students did PowerPoint presentations or made videos. And it really gave them a chance to share what it is that they've just recently learned about the culture in an interesting and interactive way with their classmates. So from there, we in court started to begin incorporating the Hofstede cultural and the model. Of course, I didn't label it as that, but we did talk about um, uh, heroes and values and rituals and symbols. And we identified the definitions of those things. And then we revisited our conversation about culture and the class discussion. So opening that conversation up again and being able to go back and identify whose presentation or whose artifact um, was connected with a symbol and whose was connected with a ritual or a hero. And, uh, um, a value. And the students really started getting into that and they were they enjoyed making that classification distinction. Um, and again it just enriched the conversation and kind of took it to the next level. And so these are some examples. Um, the students were then given a template. So here they're um, We've written the definitions, and then they needed to identify something from their own culture that fit into each of these categories. So they were allowed to draw pictures, or they could write, and then they like to draw so they were allowed to draw pictures. But now they're applying what they've learned to their to themselves. And then from there, they once again went home and talked with their parents, and now they needed to find pictures that fit into each of those categories as well. So again, this was another opportunity for rich conversation between parents and the, ch and the child. And they could either dig through old photographs and bring in um, pictures, or they could find images on the, um, the internet and, and download them. But either way, they needed to bring in different pictures or images that were symbols, values, Rituals and then they were responsible for making two to three pages of our class culture book where they had to put the correct picture and the correct 
under the correct category and then write something about it. So a caption or a sentence or a paragraph. And again, they had a lot of creative freedom in how they chose to design these pages. And then I took the book to the printer, <laughs> the local printer, and found the pages together and then made a copy for each student. So they were very creative and they really enjoyed this process. They liked making the, the books at first and then they really enjoyed looking at the books and seeing what each other, the things that each student wrote and shared. So then each student was given an opportunity to once again present and share the pages that they created with the class as the rest of the students also were able to look at the pages with them. So another opportunity for speaking. And then my evaluation at the end was based on all of these things. <laughs> so it wasn't just one test or one quiz or one aspect. It incorporated a lot of different um, parts um, and the different types of assessment. And then in the end, we had them, uh, I had asked them to write a journal reflection, which was also included in the assessment. And then using the rubric that we created, we were trying to figure out where the child is on that rubric. And some are really dynamic and very closely related, and some are in some areas, but still need work in others, which is just specifically about um, crossing dynamics. But um, it's a good way to assess kind of where they're at and their growth and, of course, scaffolding next steps to continue to um, have the students strengthen their cultural awareness and skills in those areas. And then we wrapped up with a final class discussion and we were able to really write all the, a long list of different things that we studied about culture throughout the year. Um, and so I think through this, they were able to really see, like, wow, we learned a lot, and uh, it's been fun, and um, this is actually really fun because as they would recall things, it, you know, they would get really excited and talk a lot about, like, oh, yeah, and when we did this, this was really fun, or I really enjoyed it, we did the origami, or Nini taught us this, or this person taught us that, or we learned how to say this in this language, or, I don't know, just, uh, really great recall on, on all the dynamic things that they've learned throughout the year. And then again, it's a great formative assessment with, for me, so I can see you know, what had been learned and, and really get a clear picture of, of the impact of these lessons. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, I really want my students to be strong, cultural, culturally sensitive students and future global leaders and things like that. And so I'm able to see through their interactions that they do have cultural awareness and they do interact with respect and responsibility and um, they do appreciate each other's differences. And our class planet is very welcoming. And um, if we have, we have new, we had two new students join us this semester and they were immediately just welcomed and um, the students helped them out and kind of thought over who was going to be their, um, their helper <laughs> because they all wanted to, to be that person to make the students feel at home and welcomed. And this was an interview that I did with the students so I should do individual interviews and I think this is just a great way to sum up the impact of the students. So or the impact of this project with my students. So I asked, um, why is it important to learn about culture? And she said, you can learn about other people and how they feel sometimes. And you know a lot about the country and so that you're able to understand them better. And I asked, why is that important? And she said, so you can treat other people the way you want to be treated. And sometimes we can make them feel at home when they're away from their country. And how does learn learning about culture help to make people others feel at home. And she said, you'll understand how they live, and then you can help them by doing things the way they do it in their country. 
So I could really see that she was able to have a clear understanding of what sexual sensitivity really was. And as Lisa mentioned, uh, these are some modification options. Um, of course, I invite you to tap into your own creativity about how you feel that incorporating this type of project would be most beneficial for your students. But these are some suggestions for lower grade levels or upper grade levels, um, depending on your class dynamic and, and just kind of a launching point in, as ideas for you to. Um, to, yeah, see what works best for you. So um, that is the overview of uh, such a book project, and I hope that it gave you some ideas on ways that you can incorporate such a lesson into your classroom. So thank you for your time, and I need to share this project with you. Can everyone hear me now? I see some. Uh, Ah, okay. I don't know what happened there. My apologies for that. I just was pointing out to you that we have this uh, template for each one of these projects uh, that are available at the end of every uh, session each month. And in that, it includes the necessary information. The process steps, um, of course, are included in here, but also expected learning outcomes, critical questions, instructional strategies, resources and materials, and then uh, vocabulary and suggested range of duration for the project in your class. Of course, that'll change if you make modifications for your grade level and your age groups. Um, also including in the chat box, I'm going to post that right now. This link that you see on the slide, this is where all of those resources are, all of the readings, works cited information, links, and external links to um, future activities and uh, events that are coming from Global Ed Conference. And you'll also find that template link there for the uh, lesson plan sequence. Uh, and so lastly, I'm not sure, looks like somebody hit a button here. I have sharing application. Um, not sure what's happening there. But lastly, with a few minutes we have left, I wanted to open up um, any questions, if anyone has any questions with the last few minutes. So we can type them maybe in the chat box. There we go. Great. Thank you. Any questions? I know one of the questions that was um, asked earlier by Peggy was, and maybe Genevieve, you can answer this, if students are doing the presentations in their native, in their first language. Um, um, hello? Okay. Yep, we can hear you. Yep. <laughs> are doing, no, many of the students are bilingual or trilingual. So they did the presentation, but the, our school is an English-based school. So all of the presentations were in English. Okay, very good, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the chat? I just wanted to uh, mention something that someone brought up as far as your classroom being homogeneous. 
and that is definitely a factor in some classrooms where uh, you know, mono ethnic or whatnot. So one of our other participants suggested that even if it's even if there isn't as much cultural diversity, there is still community diversity and there's still family diversity. And so you can still do something similar with your students to create again that, that classroom dynamic of, of sensitivity, um, even if they are from similar cultural backgrounds, um, by tapping into other aspects of their life. And you can still do a, a class book um, and presentations. And so they could even see, like, even within our own culture, there's so many different ways that we live or different aspects of culture that, you know, our family values this aspect of culture and your family values that aspect of culture, you know, but um, even though it's all in the same, the same culture. So there are definitely ways that you can still incorporate a project like this in, in all classes. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions that come up? Um, I see one from Tunisia. Uh, how are students assessed in global, global project, projects? What makes the difference between one student and another? And that's a great question. And, and just a little bit of background on that question. Well, first of all, um, this is why when we assess cultural competence in students, we have to take into consideration the whole child because there is a continuum of development and everyone is in a different place in that continuum, including us as educators. We're not immune from that. We're all working on that. Age is actually something that's not a factor necessarily in that as well. So how do you assess that? Well, you do that by looking at all of the areas. You look at the quality of the projects. Um, that they're producing, the results, that is a demarcation of the application of skills that they have, how they're applying what they know, how they're applying what they feel. Um, you look at things like self-reflection, journal entries. Um, as you can see, uh, Genevieve had interview responses. This is all the kind of non-cognitive uh, piece as well inside of the social and emotional. Um, you look at the summative um, over a course of time. For example, you're going to see over a course of time with these five projects in the series, we would hope to see a growth on that rubric that students who typically um, were in the areas of limited have managed to go to something more moderate or advanced. Um, so you really need to take in all of the areas. Um, and of course, the, qual the quantitative pieces of that, if you're teaching them content knowledge, how are they performing on the information exams, the quizzes, the essays, all of this kind of stuff? So it's really a collective process, and it's important to, to understand that every child is different, um, and that when you're looking at a complete evaluation, that you're looking at all of the areas taking the whole child into account. So that's a great question. OK, so we are just about out of time. Um, if there is. Any burning questions, type them now. <laughs> if not, we're going to um, complete the session. So I just wanted to mention coming next in this segment is going to, we're going to move from the more internal process of cultural identity into thinking critically about our social perspectives, how we view the world, what is our cultural worldview, how does that impact our ability to have social awareness and interact with others. Uh, that segment will be on March 20th, Monday, March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, so it'll be the same time. Um, and so we really hope that you'll be able to join us. Um, as always, you'll get notification from Global Education Conference. If you've already signed up for the series, there will be an invitation that goes out about a day or two before uh, the series so that you have that, that direct link. And also want to remind you about some upcoming Global Education Conference events. These are dynamic. We really encourage you to be part of this great initiative. So um, the Student STEM and Entrepreneurship Conference is coming online March 4th. Please encourage your students to submit, to present, to share their ideas, to take ownership of all of the brilliant things they're doing inside of their learning communities. Uh, you also have Global Collaboration Meetup at South by Southwest. So if you are in Texas, if you're in the Austin area, or you can go to that, please join them. Um, increase that level of awareness. Um, we also have the
Cosmic Symposium in Chicago on April 3rd. That's a one-day event from global leaders uh, talking about this, these very concepts and, and, and topics. And then, of course, lastly, joining the community at Global Education Conference. Dot com. Um, there will be, uh, as I mentioned, a link to this recorded session, but you can also find it probably later in the week on Global Education Conference Network's YouTube channel, so please go there. Thank you so much. This has been an awesome experience. We're really excited for the next session, and um, any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I put Genevieve's email in the chat box. You can also email me at lisa at knowmyworld.org. I'm going to stop recording now. Uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you.